This is a 1917 German aircraft being flown by a movie stunt pilot. The pilot of that plane is our first guest on To Tell the Truth. What is your name, please? My name is Joan Hughes. My name is Joan Hughes. My name is Joan Hughes. Only one of these ladies is the real Joan Hughes. The other two are imposters, and we'll try to fool this panel. Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, Orson Bean, and Kitty Carlisle on To Tell the Truth. To Tell the Truth is brought to you this evening by Phillips Milk of Magnesia. A little Phillips for antacid relief, more for irregularity. Regular or mint flavor. And now, here's your host, Bob Collier. Thank you very much, and welcome once again to To Tell the Truth. Good evening, Good evening, Good evening Bob. All right, in front of you, you have an envelope, I'm sure. You haven't seen what's in it before, but you may see what's in it now. Open it up, please, and follow along with me. I, Joan Hughes, flew solo in an airplane for the first time when I was 15 years old. I am now a chief flight instructor and, most recently, a stunt pilot for motion pictures. I started my movie career by piloting a 1910 Demoiselle, one of the smallest aircraft that ever flew. Few of the millions of people who saw the film realized that one of those magnificent men in their flying machines was a woman, me. My latest assignment is flying World War I combat aircraft in a soon-to-be-released movie called The Blue Max, signed Joan Hughes. <laughs> three ladies, as you heard, all claim to be Joan Hughes. Let's start the questioning with Tom Poston. Tom. Thank you, bud. Uh, number two, did you have any guns on those aircraft you flew for the Blue Max? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, number three, what kind were they? Uh, shot one at a time. Uh, small rifle. Oh, number one, uh, what was that maneuver that we saw there on film at the top of the show? Well, this is terribly embarrassing, but we didn't get to see what you saw. Oh, darn it. Well, it was... Uh, sure, they didn't. Could you describe it for me? Uh, it was a slow spin into the ground. <laughs> I don't know. It's called I a crash. Uh, what is cross-controlling me, number one? I used to fly, so I don't know if... Little... I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Number one, what is cross-controlling? Cross-controlling? When you kick your rudder over to your to the port or starboard. That, okay, thank you. Thank you, Cass. Thank, thank you. you. Number two, what kind of a plane was that that was slowly spinning down? A Faust. A Faust? A Faust Scout. Yes. Thank you. Number three, what is the Blue Max? The Blue Max is an award, a meritor uh, meritorious award. Uh, thank for... you. Number one, uh, would you name me the star of the Blue Max? Um, this, well, George Poppard was one of the stars, and James Mason, well, and Miss Andres. Thank you. And uh, tell me, would you, uh, number two, would you, where the Blue Max was, uh, was uh, made? In which country? Uh, I mean, the movie. The film. The film. Well, it was a, it was a German award. Yes, but in which country was what it sh mean? shot? The movie. The, the movie. movie. The movie. Oh, Max. Where was sorry, it shot? in Ireland. Thank you. Uh, n number three, was it in the First World War or the Second World War? First World War. Thank you. Orson Bean. Yeah, there was a war. Number three, when the Kaiser's men flew their planes over England in the First World War, how did the barrage balloons stop them? Do you happen to know? No, I wasn't there then, sir. Oh, it was <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number one, uh, the, uh, do you know if the Messerschmitt had, was invented in World War I? I know it was the big World War II plane, but... Uh... Um, I, I think the Messerschmitt was actually built for a World War II, but they did have a, a Mark V Messerschmitt, which was used in World War I. Yeah. Number two, what did Eddie uh, Reckenberger fly in World War I? Do you know? Famous ace, American ace? I don't know what he flew. I knew, I, I knew he was an American, famous American yeah. ace. Kitty Carlisle. Number three, do you know what Reckenberger flew in World War II? No, I do not. Uh, number one, this demoiselle that you flew in uh, those magnificent men in their flying machines, where did you, where did you film that? Um, the magnificent men was filmed near to London 
In London? Well, it was outside, just on the Thames. We did most. We were on location some of the time down in Cornwall. Thank you. Number two, how fast did that plane fly? Uh, oh, round about 50, 55. Number three, how high off the ground would it go? Uh, 800 feet. And that's all? Yes. Number one, how did you start flying and where did you begin? I began um, when I was very young. My father was a flyer and I used to fly our own plane. Number two, how fast... That's it. I'm sorry to say it. It's time for you now to mark your ballot. So please mark them immediately without any consultation and without yeah. change. Yeah. Vote now, if you will, please, panel, for number one, number two, or number three. The team of challengers will receive, of course, $250 for every incorrect vote. All ballots marked? Yes? Oh, yeah. No? Yep. yep. Very well. Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number two. My goodness, she doesn't seem like your idea of a hot pilot, but, she, but I guess she knew uh, more about it than the other two, so I voted for her. Peggy Cass. Well, I thought it was number one because, you know, part of the Magnificent Men was filmed in Cornwall, and I thought her father's name is Hughes, maybe Howard Hughes. No wonder she could fly. <laughs> <laughs> Orson B. I voted for number one as well because I think she, uh, she mentioned Cornwall, and that's, uh, that's uh, it's called a crash. It's a difficult maneuver. Oh, I see. <laughs> Kenny Carlisle. I voted for number two because I think Mr. Uh, number one said it was George Poppard and it's George Peppard. Yeah. And the English people say funny, you know. That's like everything. Chumley, yes, yes, I know. But anyway, <laughs> 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 number two has the eyes of a flyer. You just got a British brush off in case you didn't know what oh. the horse <laughs> All right, there we have all the votes in and we'll find out now which one of these three ladies in truth is Joan Hughes. Will the real Joan Hughes please stand up? Ah. Thank you very much. Number one, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Pat Spear and I have a weekly radio show on WLIR devoted to animals called Pat Spear in the Doghouse. And number three, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Jacqueline Kelly. I'm a captain in the United States Women's Army Corps stationed at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. <laughs> Mr. Collier, I may add, I have never been up in a plane before in my entire life. <laughs> Well, when we check the score, we find there were two correct and two incorrect, and that's good. Two times the incorrect vote worth of $250 is $500, ladies. That should keep the smiles in your faces, and certainly you brought them to ours by being so nice on our show. Good night, and God bless you. And now let's meet our next team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Richard Penny. My name is Richard Penny. My name is Richard Penny. Follow along once again, if you will, panel, with your copies of this one. I, Richard Penny, am a zoologist. I've spent a total of 38 months in Antarctica studying the penguin. Penguins are flightless birds who are completely at home in the water. They use their stubby wings to propel themselves through the Antarctic seas at speeds up to 10 miles an hour. They lay their eggs on nests constructed of small stones and are very affectionate with their young. To attract a female penguin, a male bird puts on a display of flipper-waving, head-rearing, and raucous cawing. The male penguin is also a faithful husband. His incredible sense of direction seems to be oriented to the sun. And in our experiments, even though penguins were moved hundreds of miles by airplane, they unerringly returned running and tobogganing over the ice and snow to the very nest where their mates were waiting. This despite the fact that penguins often congregate in rookeries numbering over a half a million birds. Signed, Richard Penny. <laughs> Panel, 
these gentlemen all claim to be Richard Penny, as you heard. And we start this cross-examination with Peggy Cass. Peggy? Thank you. Uh, I love penguins. Number three, uh, what is an emperor penguin? An emperor penguin is the largest type of penguin in existence. Thank you. Number one, can you find penguins in the Argentine? Yes, you can. What kind? Magellanic. Little Peruvian. Green. Oh, what? I don't know. Some Uvian something. <laughs> uh, n uh, num n uh, number two, could you please tell me, did you spend any time in Queen Maud Land while you were down there? Not in Queen Maud Land, no. No. Number three, who owns Queen Maud Land? Well, no one really owns anything down there. There are various sections. I think it's in the Russian section. Thank you. Near Weddell Bay. Thank you. Number one, could you please tell me the month that you would consider winter to begin in Antarctica? Pardon? What month would you consider to be the beginning of winter? The beginning of winter? Yes. March, April. Thank you. Orson B. Uh, number uh, two. Now, I've heard stories about families moving from Seattle to Bayonne or some nicer place and uh, leaving the family cocker spaniel behind. And months later, he shows up, you know, exhausted, scratching in the front door. I've never believed them. Is it really true that your penguins could find their way back to the mate hundreds of miles? That is absolutely true, yes. My word. Number three, before they settle down to this monogamous existence, uh, do they date? <laughs> I mean, with hundreds of... Uh, <laughs> how, how do you know you're in love if all, you know, all, all penguins look the same to me? Well, the male, male puts on a good show for yeah. the female and he attracts her and in the first year they, they go together. Ah. Uh, were you leaving out the good parts? I mean, I'll, interrupt you. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Oh, uh, Kitty Carlisle. Number one. <laughs> Uh, what, the, when you took these penguins hundreds of miles away by plane, what did their mates do while they were sitting waiting? Uh, they were sitting at the nest waiting. Oh. Were they crying? No. They don't cry? Not that I know of. Well. Number two, how did you know these, did you see these penguins running and tobogganing over the snow to get home? Did you follow them in the plane? We, we did observe them, yes. Number three, how high does an emperor penguin grow? Oh, an emperor about three feet. Uh -huh. And number one, and those little tiny ones you were talking about in the Argentine, how big are they? Approximately 14 inches. Oh, and they're the same species? No, they are not. What are they? Magellanic penguin. Uh, are they also monogamous? Yes, they are. Number two, when the mate attracts the female, how does he know this is the one that's going to be for him for the rest of his life? That's hard for us to determine. <laughs> 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 well, you wouldn't think that pen penguins had enemies, but they do. Number three, what is an enemy of the penguin? The uh, skua. What is the bird? That? It's a bird. It's, it's like a um, like a seagull, but much larger. Number one, a... how does it act in, uh, in in inimically to the penguin? Number one. Number one. Yes, please. How does it interact? How does it behave in a way that's inimical to the penguin? Inimical. Uh, inimical. It's a predator on the eggs and chicks. Oh. Number two, can a penguin fight off one of these skewer birds? Yes, they most certainly can. And well, how do they become enemies of those little birds then? How do they get at the little birds ever? Two of them usually go after one, oh. and they're separated from the, uh, the rest of the uh, chicks. Thank you. That's it. Time for you now to mark your ballot. So mark them at once, without change, without consultation, as usual. Vote, if you will, now for number one, number two, or number three. Ballots all marked and swiftly. Tom, for whom did you vote? Well, I voted for number one. I didn't see anything wrong with number three's answers at all, so I can't... But uh, number one just seems so poised and calm and like, this is it, fellas, this is, but you better buy it. So I bought it. <laughs> Peggy Cat. Well, I voted for number one. See, Queen Maud Land belongs to Norway, I think, even though it is just a large ice cube. And April does begin the winter months in Antarctica. That I happen to know because I listened to it on Channel 13 or something. <laughs> <laughs> Orson. Well, they were all very good. I found out a lot of fine stuff, like them rotten skewer birds that gang up on an egg. What a rotten trick. But uh, I voted for number one because he looks like a zoologist to me. He looks like he might be more interested in animals than people, and I think he's on the right track. I think you can Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number one. 
because you have to be very young and strong to live 18 months, 38 months in Antarctica, and he looks as though he's the one that could do it. Very well, then we have it. Unanimous for number one. So we'll find out immediately which one of these gentlemen in truth is Richard Penny. Will the real Richard Penny please stand up? Thank you, sir. Incidentally, Dr. Penny is conducting his research on penguins for the New York Zoological Society and Rockefeller University. You plan to go back down there again? Yes, indeed, is next this, October. Is this something that you were assigned to because you wanted to do it? Were you interested in this uh, line of research anyway? Because I want to do it. Uh -huh. That's very uh, interesting. Have a question? Yes, please do. Is it true that they are studying the, the relativity of the sun in terms of all birds now? Yes, how they, they find their direction? They certainly are. And They're, it is true that birds are oriented toward the sun? That's not only the sun, but they can use the stars as cues to direction also. That's yes. what I did. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. And continued Penguin. success to you. Number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? I'm Ken Powers, and I'm representative for the World Book Encyclopedia. Thank you. And number three, what is your real name and what do you do, sir? My, my name is uh, Norman James. I'm port captain for Furness Bermuda Line in New York. Thank you. And checking the score, we find there were no incorrect votes, but in that case, there still is $150 coming your way, along with our sincere thanks and hope you enjoyed your visit. Goodbye and God bless you. And now let's meet our third team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Robert Lindquist. My name is Robert Lindquist. My name is Robert Lindquist. Follow along again, panel, with your next copy, please. I, Robert Lindquist, am an authority on lightning. My company installed the lightning rods on both the Capitol Building and the White House in Washington. I am also an authority on lightning protection. This summer, lightning will strike the continental United States some 20 million times. It will cause some 500 deaths, 1,500 injuries, and countless millions in property loss. When I lecture on lightning safety, I emphasize a few sensible precautions. If indoors during an electrical storm, stay away from your bathtub, furnace, fireplace, telephone, and TV set. If you are in an open field or on a golf course, lie down immediately and keep away from trees. If in swimming, get out of the water immediately and don't seek shelter under a beach umbrella. One of the safest places to be in a thunderstorm is in an automobile with a metal roof. Incidentally, lightning often strikes the same place twice, and statistics show that it strikes five times as many men as it does women. Signed, Robert Lindquist. <laughs> panel. These three gentlemen all claim to be Robert Lindquist. We'll start this round with Orson Bean. Orson? Thank you. Number three, do you have any reason as to why lightning should strike men more than women? I think that's phenomenal. Women protect themselves more. Men have a greater tendency to take a chance, get out in the open, whereas women go for protection. Oh, that, I thought there was something indigenous to the man that made the lightning uh, come to him. Well, number one, I spoke to somebody, a truthful person, who told me once upon a time, that during a summer storm, a fireball danced in the window, danced all around the room, wackity bam boom, and finally out another window, and they stood cowering against the wall. Do you believe it? Yes, indeed, I do. What is that? Well, the, the house was not properly protected with uh, a lightning rod system, and the lightning was bouncing around seeking the nearest effective ground and it was having difficulty doing so. Isn't that amazing? Number Kitty two. Carlisle. Number two, what made it take the form of a ball instead of just jagged streaks of lightning? Probably the resistance uh, build up in trying to find a path to ground. Uh -huh. uh, number one, if you're in a swimming pool, uh, should you get out of it? Number one or number three? I mean, number three. three. I'm sorry, I'm looking at number three. Yes, you should get right out of it. Right out of it. Uh, number one, why in the house? Mm -hmm. Uh, if you have a lightning rod, should you stay away from bathtub, furnace, fireplace, etc.? If you have a lightning yes. rod? 
If you have a lightning rod, your house, if the system is installed properly and effectively, you're pretty safe, uh, even near these objects. But there's no point in tempting fate. Number uh, two, uh, why is the fireplace dangerous? Well, a fireplace could be dangerous because of the soot that is built up within the chimney during in its constant use, and soot contains carbon, which is metallic. And a, and a, and a conductor. As a, and a conductor. Tom Poston. Thank you. Uh, number three, can, uh, now, I, I know lightning can strike aircraft, can it? Uh, well, does it, number three? Yes, it can. Uh, are there any uh, ill effects from that, number three? There do, do not need to be, no. That's right, because we used to go and fly up into, thunder, uh, into the bottoms of Thunderhead mm -hmm. so we'd get struck by lightning. What, number one, what is the actual effect? What happens mm -hmm. when you get struck by lightning in a plane? When you get struck by lightning in a plane? Yeah. Well, there's, there should be no electrical effect. Well, wait, what is uh, the... The visual effect. The visual effect? I I don't know. I've never been in a plane when it hit. And, yeah, it's uh, like a, the whole. A, well, a fireball could roll down the aisle of the uh, plane and then oh, jump right out. Whee! Never uh, had that happen. Number, number Peggy two. Cass. I'll never get struck by lightning because I take all the dogs and go into the closet. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, number two, does thunder always accompany lightning? Yes. Thank you. Number three, when I was a little girl, I turned on a faucet and the lightning went right up my arm and wow. across and down. And that's why I'm afraid of it. it really, but it didn't, I didn't feel anything. But it was, do you believe me? Yes, I do. I'm telling the truth. I'm glad you do. Number one, <laughs> can you get insurance against lightning striking your house? Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, number two, is it true that if you open the window, the lightning can come in with the draft? I, I don't believe it. You don't? Well, I believe it. They're all <laughs> tight, too. <laughs> uh, uh, number three, uh, has anybody ever died of fright from lightning? Not up till now. <laughs> <laughs> If you will, battle, so mark them immediately without change and without any consultation. Just vote now, please. Vote for number one, number two, or number three. All ballots marked. Tom, for whom did you vote this time? <laughs> I voted for number three because I noticed in the affidavit it says that he lectures on uh, lightning protection and so forth, and, and uh, I thought he had the demeanor of a lecturer, so I voted for number three. Peggy. I almost voted for number one because he keeps talking about if it's really got a good system, and since he sells systems, that's kind of like a pitch, right? Then I thought maybe he's being too coy. I voted for three because he has a Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of lightning up there. That's where I come from. Orson Bean. Well, I voted for number two because he looks you direct in the eye. That didn't work out too well, did it? No. There? So I kind of put Shazam in there trying to make it look more like lightning, but it didn't help. Uh, I voted for number two because he, he seemed authoritative, and if he isn't the real one, he works for uh, American Encyclopedia Britannica, whatever it is, and has the letter uh, L. Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number two because I liked his answer about the carbon and the soot in the fireplace. I never thought of that, and it sounds absolutely right to me. Not to me. Not well, that's evenly divided then. Two for three, two for two, and votes all in that way. So, let's find out now which one, in truth, is Robert Lindquist. Will the real Robert Lindquist please stand up? Ah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Robert Lindquist is president of Thompson Lightning Protection Incorporated in St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> never found out how to really protect your house? With a I lightning rod. Mm. Pardon? We never found out how to really protect your house. You say you never found out? No. no. You didn't ask. Well, that's no, what I'm no. saying. We didn't ask. Well, what do you mean? Well, what do you mean by how does it protect your house? Well, any particular kind of lightning rod. Well, there's, uh, yeah, Thompson Lightning Protection. <laughs> <laughs> I walked right into that. One of the imposters prompted him and yeah. said, Thompson Lightning Rod. <laughs> uh, it, it takes a system of air terminals, conductors, and ground terminals, all interconnected with each other, plus bonding to the soil pipes, you, water uh, pipes, which would have prevented that. interrupting. Our time is running a little <laughs> short here. Discuss it later, will you, while you're all grouped out here. And forgive me for interrupting, sir. Number one, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Larry Roxbury. I'm a passenger sales representative for Seaboard Railroad Company. 
Haggis there. And number three, and it's your real name, and what do you do? My name is Commander Robert G. Greeley. I'm in the Naval Air Reserve in Boston and Naval Aide to Governor John A. Volpe of Massachusetts. <laughs> well, checking the score proves out again what it was earlier tonight. There were two and two, and the two incorrect ones are worth $250 each, and that's $500. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Goodbye, and God bless you. See you tomorrow afternoon on the daytime show, and next week, of course, on this. Good night, panel. Good night to you. In the meantime, don't forget to tell the truth. Bye. To Tell the Truth was brought to you this evening by a new denture cream, a special denture toothpaste made with the cleaning power denture wears need. Denture cream, program pre-recorded.